Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's presentation. Uh, we know it continues to be a uh, stressful time as we uh, all uh, adapt to the health pandemic we're all uh, dealing with. So we want to thank the uh, nearly uh, 1,900 title professionals we have res registered for today's presentation on the uh, the various financial assistance options that uh, are available to businesses. Uh, before getting into the conversation, uh, I need to touch on a few housekeeping items. Um, first, we need to acknowledge and thank Qualia for sponsoring today's presentation. Uh, everyone's lines are muted uh, for the presentation. Um, are getting some messages about uh, calling number. There's only web access due to the high volume, so there is no phone number to dial in for this presentation. Um, if at any time you have a question, please submit them through the questions box. We will hold some uh, time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. A uh, copy of the presentation can be downloaded from the handout section. Uh, there you'll also find several other documents as well, uh, including a chart that compares uh, several of the loan programs, a, a document we've put together on, on many of the frequently asked questions regarding the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, there's also the uh, PPP loan application that you can download from, from the handout section. And there's also a loan calculator that uh, you can use to help determine the maximum loan you could get under the program. And uh, as an added benefit, uh, today's presentation is being recorded. So, you know, if you have to drop off, you can you can access the recording later. We'll send we'll send an email with a link later today, and it will also be on Alta's website. Um, there on the first slide, you can see uh, our Alta.org coronavirus uh, URL. Uh, there you can go for all of our resources we have have on this. Um, before turning the presentation over to Steve Gottheim, um, ALTA Senior Counsel, we, we wanted to ask a few poll questions just to get a better sense of the type, types of companies represented on today's webinar. And um, so if you don't mind, we'll just take you know, a few minutes here. And the first question is um, just to get a sense of the size of the companies here. And um, if you all don't mind, just letting us know if you have less than 500 employees. Let me just give you a few more seconds. We'll go ahead and close it. Only 5% of you have voted, so. All right, we're getting up there. I'll close it here as soon as we get over half. All right, Steve, just so for your knowledge, we've got about, uh, you know, over 90% uh, I have uh, less than 500 employees. So we'll close that one. Last, the next one, we also want to know, you know, um, kind of your um, business makeup. If you're a sole proprietor, self-employed, or a contract worker, if you don't mind letting us know about this. So we have been getting lots of questions on, on whether, you know, sole proprietors or if you're a contract worker, um, whether or not you're eligible for a financial assistance under the PPP program. All right, just give you a few more seconds. Looks like getting over half. Steve, again, just for your knowledge, about you know, 46% are saying yes, they're sole proprietor, self-employed, or contract worker. And the last question, you know, if um, just curious, you know, how many people are are, are you know thinking they they are going to uh, need some financial assistance to maintain payroll as we uh, work through this crisis. Well, Steve, early numbers, you know, about 55% say, yeah, they, they already are thinking that uh, um, they are going to need help. Um, a third aren't sure yet, and about 10% no. So um, thank you for uh, you know, sharing a little bit of information about kind of your your situation. And, and uh, with that, Steve, I will uh, turn the presentation over to you. 
All right, thank you, Jeremy. And uh, I appreciate all that, that information about our audience today because I think that last question is the most telling. A lot of companies right now, especially in, in the title industry, are really in that not sure yet. Will they, you know, they don't know that they're gonna need uh, assistance, financial assistance during this crisis. Um, March has been a, a decent month for a lot of companies. Um, and, and we're just starting to see the impacts of, of COVID-19 on uh, the beginning of the spring purchase market. And so, you know, people are, are naturally very worried and there's a lot of economic uncertainty. And that's really what these payroll protection loans are, are meant to address. And as we'll get through this program today, we'll kind of talk about all the qualifications it takes to uh, apply for a loan, what it takes to get that loan. And then we'll also talk about the loan forgiveness options along with some of the other options that are out there and other things that you want to think about if you are looking for financial help from the federal government during this time. Um, so here you kind of see the, the rundown of everything we're going to talk about today. Probably the two things we're going to talk the most about are those paycheck protection loans and the payroll tax deferrals, because those are really your two biggest options. The payroll, uh, the PPP loans, if you're a small business under 500 employees, the payroll tax deferral, if you are a company that does not wind up applying for and getting a PPP loan, that will be your biggest uh, you know, financial aid, uh, aid that you can get from the federal government. So as we start to, to think about, I, I know, uh, well, you know we'll, we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into all of the uh, details in a second, but just a quick refresher for everybody. Um, you know, all of the products, all of the programs that we're talking about are really part of one of three different aid packages that Congress has passed over the last little over a month, uh, in a, a little over a month. You know, the first one, that first phase one was really just aid to help in vaccine development and healthcare costs. Um, number two, phase two, which was passed in kind of the middle of March was that Families First Coronavirus Act, which uh, dealt with paid sick leave and expanded sick leave uh, for, for families and expanded FMLA leave. We'll talk about that program and um, how small businesses can get tax credits to cover the increased paid sick leave that you are offering to your, that you now need to offer to your employees during this crisis. And then really the bulk so far has been this $2 trillion CARES Act, the, uh, the, the larger stimulus package that has both payments to individuals, those $1,200 payments to, uh, to, to uh, individual Americans, 500 for children, uh, along with these small business loans, which are kind of the centerpiece of the, uh, of the business part of, of that $2 trillion package. We know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot still in the works. And then, then we're, we're, you know, we continue to hear in D.C. that um, the recognition that there's probably going to be at least one more package related to uh, coronavirus that needs to get passed. Originally, we were hearing Congress was going to come back here to town uh, in April, at uh, about April 20th. Sounds like that might get pushed back to May. Um, but there are still opportunities that we're hearing about for Congress to, to do other things to get more aid out there whether it's aid to state and local governments, which is what is going to be kind of the, the big part of, uh, of package four, uh, you know, aid for, for processing uh, unemployment uh, insurance claims, aid for processing uh, for, for health care needs. Um, we're also hearing that part of that is probably going to be an expansion of the PPP program, the, the paycheck, the payroll protection program. Um, the early numbers that keep getting floated out is that there might be a need for another $250 billion to be appropriated uh, for, for aid to small businesses. So, um, you know, as much as we're going to talk about the fact that um, you want to be thinking today about, you know, what your needs are going to be because of how limited the funds are in this program, there might be more funds made available sometime in the future. So, again, our, our centerpiece of our conversation today is really going to be on this payroll protection program. Um, and this is a, a, a new program that was developed as part of the CARES Act. Is again, $350 billion uh, of loan guarantees made available to uh, uh, small businesses, employ, uh, businesses that employ 500, 500 people or less um, to cover basically two months worth of payroll. You can see kind of some of the basic details here on the screen. One of the things that I wanted to, to, to flag because we're hearing this right now is you know, there, there are still a lot of uh, kinks to be worked out in this program. And so we're going to go through the kind of steps it takes to go and get one of these loans in a second. Um, but first, let's, you know, talk about some of the some of the issues that you might encounter. You know, this program is being administered by the Small Business Administration through its uh, through its 7A loan program. Prior to uh, prior to last week, there were only about 1400 banks and credit unions nationwide that were authorized. Uh, SBA lenders that, that were in this program. 
since then about another 500 have, have filed applications to, to get into this program. So we know new banks are being added every day. In an average in an average year in the tw in, in in the last 10 years, the SBA uh, 7A program only processed on average 60,000 loans per year, issuing only about 30 billion dollars worth of loans um, in a given year. To contrast, in the first three days of this payroll paycheck protection program, just one bank, Bank of America, accepted 177,000 applications for aid for $32.5 billion worth of aid. So we're talking, you know, not just an unprecedented level of volume that is going to be moving through this, but this is also a program that's really only gotten itself up and running in about one week. And so, you know, first piece of advice to everybody out there, if you have started the process of applying for a loan or if you're about to start the process, be prepared for some hiccups and be, you know, prepared to kind of try to work through them with your bankers because they're learning this at the same time you're all learning all of this as well. So let's kind of dig deeper into the into the PPP program. You know, the first question everyone is going to ask is, you know, who's eligible for a loan and how much are you really going to be able to borrow, right? You want to know before you go into a bank, you know, whether what your likelihood of getting a loan is going to be and you you kind of want to know how much you should be asking for on an application. Um, so as we look at kind of the basic criteria, one of the unique features of the PPP program is that there really are not very many, if any, lending criteria involved here. The basic rule of thumb is you need to be a small business, you need to be a, a, a business that includes sole proprietors, that includes independent contractors, that includes self-employed individuals, operating in the United States, having been in business before February 15th of this past year, of this current year, so February 15, 2020, and have 500 employees or less. Um, the, you know, the caveat to that last question is, um, you, if you have more than 500 employees, you might still also be eligible if you have gross revenue of less than $12 million as a, as a title insurance agency. Um, but if you have 500 employees or less, it doesn't matter how much revenue you have at all. You're, you're, you're at least meeting the basic qualifications of this loan program. So uh, you know, before we move on to the, the last second, you know, what one other interesting thing to think about again, because we, we, we did touch on this in our poll, right? That, that 500 employees or less is, is an important thing to think about. We know from our data uh, here at ALTA that 97% of title companies employ less than 500 people uh, in their operations. Uh, in total, title agents that employ less than 500 people actually, in total, employ 60,000 Americans across the country with an average wage of about $59,000 a year. So we know that you are, are, are great drivers of the, of the economic engine, and, and we really know that the majority of almost almost all ALTA members are going to be eligible on the basic part of, uh, of the PPP program. And so really, it's going to come down to a question of, you know, are you in financial need? Do you need this money? And, and do you want to uh, make an application for it? And then, you know, what are you going to use it to spend on? Now, there are some businesses that are not eligible for a PPP loan. Um, you know, there's really kind of uh, three categories of businesses to really think about that aren't eligible for a loan. One is if your business is illegal under federal or state law. So, as much as uh, we've talked a lot about marijuana and, and banking and marijuana and title insurance over the last few years because of that growing business at the state level, unfortunately, if you have marijuana customers, they're, they're not likely to be eligible to get a payroll loan uh, through the SBA because it is illegal under, the, under federal law. Um, household workers, uh, you know, if, if you are, are house, if, if someone in your family or someone you know is a, a nanny or, or some other type of household worker, uh, there, there's a, a, a provision in, in, in the FBA regulations that says those types of uh, jobs are not considered uh, are not considered businesses, um, and so they're excluded from uh, from this. And then this other one is whether or not you uh, you or one of your owners um, have either been indicted for a crime, or currently is serving a sentence, or uh, has recently in the last seven years defaulted on an SBA loan and caused some loss to the federal government. If you uh, meet one of those requirements, and, and we can go into more detail in a little while, uh, you also won't qualify for this. And I, I will say again, that includes, 
you know, you if you're the primary owner, but it also might include your minority owners that fall to that qualification if they're 20% or more of your ownership structure. So we talked about there are really not very many, uh, really not very many at all uh, requirements for um, for these SBA loans, right? You have to be a business in the United States, 500 people or less. The only other real qualification is that you need to have be facing and certify that you're facing some economic uncertainty that makes a loan necessary for the continued operation of your business. So if you think about it, I can't imagine that there is a business in the United States right now that doesn't meet that qualification, right? Everybody's facing some level of economic uncertainty caused by the coronavirus emergency. Everybody's seeing either some hard swings, whether it's the stock market, whether it's, you know, 20 or 30 percent of businesses across the country that have been forced to shut down because they are uh, subject to stay at home orders. So we know that, that most businesses out there are going to qualify and be able to make that basic certification uh, around, around qualifying for it. So it really comes down to, you know, if you're going to get an SBA loan, making sure that you're in the position to one, have all your documentation ready to, to try to get one of these loans, make it as fast and easy as possible for you to get it, and then also knowing exactly how you want to spend it so that you can take advantage of the forgiveness options by spending it on things like payroll, rent, utilities, and mortgage interest payments. So go now that we've gone through the qualifications, we'll go through kind of the basic how much can I borrow calculation. Rule of thumb is you can borrow up to 250% of your average monthly payroll cost. So think of this as go back to the last 12 months, figure out how much you've been, uh, your average payroll, your, your, how much your payroll is, divide it by 12, and then you know, multiply that number by 2.5. And you can see the example here on the screen. Um, a couple of caveats to think, about, to think about here. One, again, the maximum loan amount you can get is capped at $10 million. Um, there, there's, there's you know, not gonna be a ton of title companies that come that hit into that number, but it is a cap that people need to be mindful of. Two, there is this provision that caps the amount, of the, the amount of salary that you can include in that calculation for any single employee or owner of the company at $100,000 per annum. So you, the, the most you can add in to that payroll calculation from a wages standpoint um, for any one employee in a month for a month is $8,333. So again, you take that whole total payroll, you take your total payroll, you divide it by 12 to get your average monthly payroll, you, you then multiply it by 2.5 and that's gonna get you your, uh, your, your, basic, uh, your basic amount that you're eligible to borrow. And in our example here, it's $250,000 based on a $1.2 million payroll. But the thing that you need to be thinking about is payroll costs are really more than just uh, how much cash or, or, or how much money you're giving to an employee as their salary, right? Um, you know, you, you may have a salary, uh, uh, an employee that makes $80,000. So you think, all right, you know, I'm just basically taking 80,000, dividing it by 12, and that's how much salary for that one individual I include in, in my calculation. But the reality is you're actually allowed to include other, other non-cash compensation that you are providing to employees as well in that monthly payroll cost. So you can include things like, if you are per, if you buy uh, health insurance, group health insurance for your employees, you can include things like if you're providing paid family uh, or sick leave already, um, absent of whether or not you just started doing it under the Families First Act. Um, you can add in whether or not you make a 401k match or if you have a pension program that you make payments to, and then also you can add in if you have to pay a portion of a uh, of a state or local uh, tax on payroll. So you know, it is more than just the, the basic salaries that you're paying in that you add into this cost. You really wanna take a look at what is that true all-in cost per month that you're, paying to an, that you're paying as compensation to an employee from both a salary and a benefit standpoint. Important thing to remember here is this bottom point again, this program is available to uh, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and, and, and any other type of business. So for a, a, a smaller, for a title company, you're able to add in as the owner of a title company, you can add in your own compensation into that calculation. So, um, you know, if you have, if you have, if, if you have, you know, your employees, you also might add in whatever similar compensation that you're paying yourself. Um, one of the big questions that we get frequently is, 
how does this work if you also employ people like independent closers or independent search ex or independent searchers um, that, that you pay on a 1099 basis? How do you can you include their uh, that 1099 uh, revenue or, or expense in this calculation? The answer for that is no. So if you are a company that you have five employees, but you also employ or, or utilize five independent closers on a on a regular basis, you don't include the the amount of money that you're paying to those independent closers in your payroll protection application. Those independent independent closers have the ability themselves to go apply for a loan, you know, based on the revenue that they've been getting from you. And so, you know, you can help them apply for that loan. You can help them document all of the amounts that you've paid. Uh, to them over the course of a year so that they have an easier chance applying for that loan but it's on on, on them to apply for their own uh, compensation loan uh, you can't apply you can't take the amounts you've paid to them and put them into your into your bucket for determining how much of a loan you get um, you know just as we talked about earlier you know along with uh, you know so those are the things that you can add into uh, in, into that payroll calculation the things that you can't add in um, are, are also important to think about. One, uh, you can't add in any uh, compensation that you pay to a non-US based employee. So we do know that, you know, title companies, there are a number of title companies that maybe have some employees or some uh, some staff that they have uh, overseas, whether it's through an outsourced title data provider um, or, 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 or thing like that. Um, you, you don't include their uh, income uh, in this calculation. Um, you also don't include income uh, for employees that are, 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 you don't include any income above $100,000 that you're paying to an employee. So if you have a couple of very highly compensated individuals in your, in your, um, in your organization, all you can do is cap the amount that you're applying for it as if you were paying them $100,000. Again, adding in only essentially $8,300 some odd dollars of salary into that payroll compensate, into that payroll calculation that you're making. Um, you also don't uh, you, you also uh, don't uh, file in any amounts that you're paying in payroll taxes or things like that. Um, so, it's, so it's an important thing to, to just remember. We're really talking about again gross salary that you're paying on a monthly basis to employees plus the gross the gross cost of those benefits that you're paying on a monthly basis to employees. So that is kind of the basics of of uh, uh, of the eligibility side of things. Now we're going to turn to kind of the process of how do you actually go about applying for one of these loans and you know the first step is going to be to find a lender as we said most uh, most bank credit unions about 1400 uh, banks and credit unions depository banks are, are uh, currently SBA lenders um, and that's really the best place to start you should always start with a bank that you already have a relationship with see if they're an SBA lender um, they're gonna have the easiest time processing your application um, because they already know your business in some form if if it turns out that your local bank that you've been doing this with is not an SBA lender, you can always look at the SBA lender match page. The link's here on the screen. Um, it just searches by zip code, tries to find you a, a local lender somewhere uh, in, in near you that is also an SBA lender. Again, more lenders are being added every day to the SBA program. Um, so you want to, you know, even if your bank is not uh, not in that program right now, just ask, you know, ask them. They might have a plan to join very shortly, and so it might just make sense to. Mm -hmm. To work with them because they can get approved pretty quickly. The reason you you probably want to start with your bank is is obviously they know your business very well. You're probably a large customer for a lot of your local depository banks in your in your county. Um, it, you know, if you if that's where you're housing your escrow account, um, so they know your business. They're incentivized to to work on your account maybe a little bit faster because you're a larger customer of theirs. The other important thing is they've already done some level of customer due diligence on you, and so we know. Um, no, the banking laws still require, no matter what, that if you are going to apply for a loan or if you're going to apply for a, a new account at a bank, you need to go through what they call a customer identification program uh, uh, process, which means you know the bank's going to need to ask for all of those basic things like we asked for under a GTO requirement. They're going to ask you for uh, copies of your driver's license. They're going to ask you for beneficial ownership information and all that information about your about your other partners and beneficial owners. And so, you know, if you are going to a bank that you don't already have a relationship with, be prepared to start gathering all of those documentation, all of that corporate documentation, LLC documentation, along with the people who are otherwise partners in your business, so that you can provide one quick package to your bank uh, as you're as you're starting the loan process, so that they can go and do that due diligence uh, component. Once you find a bank that is L, that that is able to do an SBA loan, 
right? The next thing we're going to do is actually go through and, and do the application. So as, you, as Jeremy said, if you look at the handout section here on, a, on the right hand side of your screen, you will see a PDF version of the uh, of the standardized FBA uh, PPP application. We're going to just go quickly through some of the requirements of it, but you know you'll, you'll want to take a deeper look at this as you're thinking about uh, making an application and, and completing it. You know, again, we're we're talking. Uh, the most important thing that you're trying to think through here as you're thinking about your application is you want to try to figure out how much you know, try to figure out as much of that information and documentation that you need at the beginning of the process so that you can give it right over to your bank at the beginning so that they don't have to hound you for more information on the back end as they're processing and approving a loan. The more information you get up front, the faster you're going to be able to get approved for a loan in most instances. So think about what documentation you need, right? There's only a couple of criteria here, right? You need to document how many employees you are because you have to prove that you have 500 or less employees. You have to document your payroll costs because you're at, your maximum loan amount is determined based off of your payroll costs. So think about getting you know, those payroll processor records, any tax file, payroll tax filings that you make on a quarterly basis, um, you know, of other types of expenses that and income documentation that you might have if you're a sole proprietor and maybe you're not, um, you know, using as much of, 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 of a robust payroll system. Any financial documentation that you can think of that will help to document those basic things, that you are a business, you've been in place for, that's been in operation before February 15th, 500 employees or less, and you can document how much you're asking for uh, in a loan because you have your payroll costs right there. So quickly going through the application, first page or first section of the first page is really just, again, all that basic information about yourself, um, all the information that people are gonna need to do to, to do a, a CIP, uh, customer due diligence program around you, and also to document how much money you're asking for. Um, again, we got, we've already gone through some of these qualification period uh, qualifications here. But these are again just making sure that they're, the bank is able to weed out the people who are ineligible for a loan fairly quickly. Um, and then we get into kind of the, the 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 important part, which is these sets of certifications and that you're going to need to make. So for most uh, for most banks, they they are allowed to make loans based solely on uh, accepting as true everything that you put in your application. They don't have to do a verification process. They don't have to go back and and double check with your payroll processor that the documentation you gave them is correct. They are allowed to just, um, if they want to, take that documentation as accurate and use it for a loan, which is why you have to, as, as, which is why they're asking you as a borrower to make a number of certifications here to let them rely on those certifications. And so you can see, uh, you know, most of these cer certifications again, that you're certifying you had employees, that you paid salary, that you that a loan is necessary to support ongoing operations of your business. All of those things are certifications that you need to make uh, to, to, to get this loan. The one caveat I you know, urge you to make is, yes, while banks do not have to do any other additional due diligence beyond having you fill out this application for uh, making sure that they are able to back up that loan, some banks may do ask for more, so be prepared for that. Also be prepared for the fact that if you are making statements and, and, and filling out this application, you are doing so uh, on a federal form that subjects you to potential federal criminal liability if you are lying on any of these certifications that you're making. So answer these truthfully, answer them honestly. Um, and that's why it's, you know, it's really important to have grabbed as much of that data as you can beforehand so that you are able to answer all of these questions very honestly and very truthfully. Again, so we talked already a little bit about the, the only thing that the, that the bank really needs to do once they receive your application is they need to confirm the receipt of all that documentation. They need to double check your math, make sure you, the math that you did to figure out how much money you want to apply for is the same as you're actually entitled to based on your documentation. And that's really it. Once they do that, they are allowed to fund and, and issue that loan and then eventually sell that loan off. Uh, some banks, again, might ask for more. And so you need to be prepared for what that is, which is why it's always good to have a, a conversation with your local bank and with your banker and understand if there is going to be requirements above and beyond just the pure basic requirements of the program. We've already kind of touched on this, um, this subject, so we'll just kind of skip ahead to now thinking about, you know, one of the uh, parts of this program that really makes it attractive for, for, for small businesses is this loan forgiveness part uh, portion. And so the, the, the basic rule of thumb is if you get a if you get a PPP loan, 
you are eligible to have 100% of that loan forgiven if you spend it on the right things, if you spend it on keeping people employed at the same salary or rate of pay that they've already been making, and a couple of other items to keep your business open, and utilities, mortgage interest. So as we look at, uh, you know, as, as we look at kind of, again, that there's the list of the you're allowed to, sp to spend that money on. But the most important one to really think about is the fact that you want to spend the majority of your money, 75% or more, um, on payroll costs, on keeping people employed at the same rate of pay and per continuing to provide them health care and retirement benefits. If you spend the money on those, on those topics and on those items over the eight-week period after your loan is funded, you will be eligible to have 100% of that loan uh, forgiven as part of a, as part of loan for as, with under loan forgiveness options here. If you wind up spending some of that money on items that are not forgivable, the the basic reality is the the, the, the what what this is is it turns into a just a regular loan, a term loan, and so the term of that loan is a two-year loan at a one at a one percent interest rate. Um, you have repayment that's deferred for the first six months. There's no other fees to the borrower, uh, no prepayment penalty. Um, so think about this as, you know, maybe you're a business that you're you're facing some level of economic concern. You don't know what what April and May hold for your for your uh, order volume right now. So you you can you can at least make that certification. Economic uncertainty means that a loan would be important and necessary for keeping your business in operation. But maybe what turns out that April and May are actually good good for you, and you don't really need the money. You know, the basic rule of thumb is even if you don't wind up needing the money, even you can still spend it on payroll and 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 still apply and try to get loan forgiveness. But you can also always just pay back that loan to the federal to to, to your bank and essentially to the federal government um, at at minimal or no cost. No matter what, this is going to be one of the cheapest business loans that you're ever going to get if you wind up having to repay it. You know, but the, but the basic goal is to make sure that you don't have to repay much or if any of it, because you should be eligible to get most of it forgiven. So again, you're able to get uh, the full amount of your loan forgiven based on, or I should say, you're able to get the full amount of money that you spend over an eight-week period starting the day is originated when you get the money, when it's dispersed. If you spend, for the amounts of money that you spend on payroll costs, rent, utility, mortgage, and mortgage interest. So if you're spend, you know, if you spend your money on those things, you're going to be eligible to apply for forgiveness. You can do that right now. We know that the SBA is, is working on rules for how to, uh, to for banks about how to uh, uh, how to process those loan forgiveness requests. Um, all the rules say right now is that a lender has 60 days to respond after you submit a request for forgiveness. So you know, stay tuned. For, stay tuned for some of the, some of those requirements. But again, if you if you spend your money in, in on those areas and you can document that you spent your money on those areas, you have a better chance of getting that loan forgiven. And, and then again, this costs you, uh, you know, as it really becomes a no cost loan to you or, or really almost a grant at that point. So think about some of the tips that we're hearing from agents across the country on this. You know, there, there are a lot of agents that are setting up separate accounts to uh, take in the money that they get from this SP, from an, a PPP loan so that then they can spend the money out of that account and document where it's going. So they'll, uh, they'll use that, that account, they'll, they'll, they'll pay their payroll, pay, they'll, they'll, they'll use that to submit money to their payroll provider. They'll use that to pay, you know, to pay their, their rent payments for the month. Um, but, you know, just again, to help them create a better create a paper trail there, you know, creating a separate segregated account for that purpose. So think about some of those things that you might do if you decide to apply for a loan to document um, how you spent that money. So again, we uh, the, the the thing to again remember here, just one point to touch on this slide is um, because this is a, a loan program t under typical uh, rules. If you had an amount of a loan that is forgiven, it would uh, count towards your gross income for tax purposes. Congress has waived that provision in this instance, so um, you, know, you don't have to worry about that again. But you do have to make sure that you're spending your uh, proceeds on, in the right way, so that you're eligible for those lo for, for that loan forgiveness. Uh, so the last big question that we can continue to get about this program is really this one: uh, you know, what what do I do if I if I've already laid off staff 
or if I if I'm still going to need to lay off staff. You know, the first you know the first instance, folks should know that if you've already had unfortunately to lay off or or furlough some staff, um, you don't have to have done that to be able to apply for a loan. Again, the goal of this program is to keep people employed, not to re-employ people that you've laid off. So if you haven't laid off staff, that's you're still eligible for a loan. But if you have laid off staff since February 15th, one of the best things that you can do and one of the best ways that you can spend your loan, your PPP money is to bring them back onto the payroll in some form. Um, whether or not you're eligible, you know, the amount of loan forgiveness you're eligible is directly tied to how much, uh, how much of your staff is still employed uh, in two months at versus what was employed in February on February 15th. So if you had 20 people employed by your company on February 15th um, and only 15 people employed uh, at the end of June, um, you have to reduce the amount of forgiveness that you're eligible for, uh, you know, by a quarter essentially in that, or in that in that instance by five by by by, by a proportional amount, five out of 20. Um, so it, there there is a, a benefit to bringing people back into uh, employment if you've had to lay off people in the last few weeks. Um, again, the same thing is if even if you maybe not laid off people, but you've reduced their salary levels, right? You've 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 cut their pay. Uh, again, the the goal is to make sure that that eligibility is really tied to is your staffing the same at the same level as it was on February fifteenth, and is the rate of pay of for people rate of pay the same as it was uh, on February fifteenth? They may be working less hours. They may be working. Um, you, you you may have furloughed people for in that aspect of it where they're not working as many hours or maybe only working twenty instead of forty hours. But if you are employing the same number of people and they're paid the same rate they were at, 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 on February 15, then you're going to be eligible for 100 percent uh, loan forgiveness here, as long as you spent the money the right way. So that is it on the payroll protection program. We're going to go through a couple of other programs here, federal aid, and then we'll get to some of your questions. The second uh, program here that we want to go through is the EIDL program, the Emergency Economic Disaster Relief Pro uh, Loan Program. This is an SBA program that's in, been in place for a number of years that's designed to you know, originally provide financial assistance to businesses that are uh, located in a, in a disaster area, right? If you're uh, located in an area where a hurricane hit and you're now business is closed because of that hurricane and, and, and there's no business, you, know, you can apply for one of these loans. The basic thing to think about is, um, you know, th there are a lot of very similar qualifications between an EIDL loan and a, a PPP loan. The caveat I would make is that the loan terms for a PPP loan are significantly better, right? Uh, there, the maximum amount you can borrow under the EIDL is two million. It's a higher interest rate and all of those types of things. Um, there actually is some level of credit underwriting that has to go into effect here. So while the EIDL program is available to you, um, in almost all instances, it's going to be better for you to just apply for a payroll protection loan as opposed to an EIDL. The one instance where it's a little bit better to start with the EIDL program is if you need money quickly, because one of the things that the EIDL program has is these $10,000 emergency grants. So um, on the date of application, if you apply for an EIDL loan, you're eligible for a $10,000 cash grant immediately that you don't have to pay back. It will be subtracted from your loan amount later on. It'll be also be subtracted uh, from a PPP loan if you decide to go uh, not get the EIDL and go for the PPP instead. Uh, but that's really the one benefit of this program to think about is this a quick $10,000 cash infusion that you can get. Um, for most companies, especially in our industry, if you are uh, looking for financial aid, the, the, the better financial aid program out there uh, is, is the a payroll protection program. So we talked a little bit about um, sick leave tax credits, the, the expansion of, of the FMLA leave and the and expansion of paid sick leave as part of that family's first coronavirus relief package, the phase two package Congress passed in the middle of the month. Um, we, we won't go through the, the details too uh, in, in too much detail here, but know that for businesses of, uh, under uh, of 500 employees or under, you do need to expand uh, expand the allowance to give people uh, paid uh, paid family leave or paid sick leave if family leave if it's uh, if they need to take leave uh, and are unable to work remotely to care for a child 
or a dependent that is sick, somebody in their household that's sick and subject to a quarantine order, or uh, whose school has closed because of a quarantine order. And then you can see here some of the details and, and some of the terms of those programs. Um, you know, again, the sick leave is if, if your employee is sick and, and they need to uh, not work because again, a quarantine order, they're eligible for two weeks of paid sick leave, um, capped at, five, at an equivalent pay of $511 per day. For most small businesses, the important thing to think about is that uh, is that you're is that you have to provide these uh, these benefits, and then you're basically going to recoup the cost for some of those benefits by applying for tax credits later on uh, later on uh, later on in the year. Uh, and so here's kind of just some of the some of the basics for 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 reimbursement through those tax credits. Again, they're fully refundable. Um, either as a, a full as a full credit against any taxes, any income tax that you owe on your business income tax return, or if you actually wind up uh, needing to uh, claim a credit higher than the amount of tax you would have owed, uh, the Treasury is authorized to uh, just cut you a straight check for this. So again, they are fully refundable tax credits that'll be in place for the next few months or through the end of the year. Um, so if you've not already made your plan and figured out how to how to implement um, implement these benefits of paid sick leave. Again, those went into effect on April 1st. So you need to make sure you know how to, uh, that you've offered that to your employees and then be aware and talking with your accountant about how to claim these tax credits as necessary throughout the rest of the year. So as we talked about, if you're not gonna go for the PP, if you don't wind up applying or getting a PPP loan, really the second uh, best federal uh, uh, aid that's gonna be out there is really this tax, payroll tax deferral option. So again, it is an, it's an option for an employer of any size. So it's not capped at 500 employees or less. Any size employee or employer can defer payment of their portion of the Social Security payroll tax, that 6.2% tax. Um, and so they can defer that payment through the rest of this, you know, that would have been owed through the rest of this year. Um, and then they can make that payment back and they repay it over two installments over the coming two years. So um, you can pay back, you know, you have to pay back at least 50% of it by December 31st, 2021. Uh, and then you have to pay out any remainder that you haven't already paid back by December 31st, 2022. The big caveat is this one from this last slide here, which is if you get a PPP loan, then you're not eligible for a payroll tax deferral. If you don't get a PPP loan or an in, are not eligible for a PPP loan, then you can claim this tax payroll tax deferral. So these are kind of the two options that are out there for businesses, it's, it's take a PPP loan if you need them if you need that money, or defer your payroll tax uh, obligation for a year, uh, and, and then repay that over over a number over over the coming two years. Similar to that, there there are also a series of employee retention tax credits that people are eligible to obtain. So again, um, if you are if you are are retaining people on your payroll. Uh, especially if your business has been financially impacted by COVID, so you've seen revenue drop and you, you're documenting a significant drop of your gross receipts over the coming year, uh, you're able to uh, claim a, a, a refundable tax credit for up to 50% of the first $10,000 in wages that you pay an employee. Um, so again, it, another option that's out there for people along with, uh, along with those others uh, to think about just some of the payroll, some of the financial uh, incentives that are in place to keep you to, to have you keeping people on your payroll throughout this crisis um, we'll not go through too much of the detail about uh, about the about how you calculate the tax credits but um, you know just keep this in mind that if you are seeing significant drops in your revenue throughout the year talk to your accountant about your eligibility for this type of tax credit the last program that we'll talk about and then we'll jump into questions is the exchange stabilization fund this is the $450 billion that is the Treasury controls that is uh, that is being uh, given to the Federal Reserve so that they can uh, support loans to businesses up to about $4 trillion of financial loans. Again, the, the, the reason to bring this up is just, you know, if you are a business out there that has relied on, on traditional commercial type of financing, whether it's commercial paper, uh, whether you're using the commercial paper market, whether you're using other term asset financing for your business, know that there's uh, that the Federal Reserve and this money is out there to pump more liquidity into those markets, hopefully to make those loans easier and continue to have them flow to your business. So those might be options uh, that you see from your from your from your bank that still are still open because of this extra money that was included in 
in the third uh, stimulus package. So before we get to the questions, I just want to remind everybody to uh, continue to take a look at all of our resources on our, our, our Alta website, alta.org forward slash coronavirus. Um, you can certainly look at uh, you know our, our, our daily COVID updates that we're sending out, and, and uh, I know that's become a, a really important tool, along with our, our county closures tracker um, that's out there. So you know, very helpful uh, to, to, to those resources. We're also going to start, uh, we'll be doing over the next few weeks, a number of surveys out to all to members to try to better understand the financial in situation that you're in and the impact of COVID on your business. So stay tuned and look out for those emails as well. And we encourage you to participate in those surveys. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jeremy and we'll start our question and answer period. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, as we mentioned at the top of the webinar, uh, please submit your questions in the uh, question, questions box. They've been flooding in, Steve, as uh, you've been talking. Um, we'll, we'll try to, to get as many as we can. There's a lot of variations on, on kind of the same questions. Um, so we'll just dig in. We've got you know, 10, 13 minutes. We'll uh, just, uh, Steve, we'll just rapid fire them at you. <laughs> All right. Again, you know, maybe just give a, a top line. A lot of questions of uh, sole proprietor. I'm an attorney. Am I eligible? Yes, right? Yep. So if you're a sole proprietor, if you're just a solo attorney, solo practitioner, you're eligible. You can include your, you know, you fill out your application and include and document your income out of your practice. My father's a sole proprietor. That's something he's eligible to do. And I know he's looking at it as well. Um, but if you also have some support staff on your, on your, on your staff, maybe you have a secretary or a paralegal, uh, maybe you have, uh, you know, maybe you have some other legal support staff, you, you can also include their payroll costs in there as well. The thing to remember again is because it, sole proprietors or and independent contractors can apply for their own loan, you don't include if any amounts you're paying to independent contractors in your loan application. You help them apply for their own loan, but you don't include their, the amount that you've been paying an independent contractor uh, in your loan request. Okay. Could you touch on uh, affiliations uh, again and how that works? So say if some people in the presentation operate a law firm, also operate a title company, they share employees, can they mm -hmm. apply separately or do they combine that into one application? Yeah, so th what I will tell you is if you are in a business that has some level of affiliation, right, common ownership, uh, you know, common ownership of multiple businesses by the same group of people or even just one person is a common 20% owner of a number of businesses, the affiliation rules are fairly complex. Um, but the basic rule of thumb is, if you have one person that is a common owner, 20% or more of multiple businesses, you wind up having to aggregate all of those businesses together for purposes of determining your qualifications and then also uh, for purposes of applying for a loan. So, you know, for example, if you have a title company that employs 50 people and a law and you're also a lawyer and you have a law firm that employs 10 people, you're essentially going to apply for the payroll of 60 people and you're going to include all of those people into that same application. Where this can come out to really hurt a company might be when, um, again, where maybe one one of their businesses is at you know 480 people and the other is 100 people, and so they both individually could have applied, but because you have to affiliate them, they can't apply. Um, that that's really where you're going to come into a, 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 a difficult time. All right, uh, this question has come up a few times. Um, again, self-employed, but they don't issue a 1099. This uh, to themselves, and they don't pay themselves a salary. I just pay out of each closing. I list my income and expenses on my tax returns. What, what kind of documentation are they going to need for that? Yeah, so that's going to be a harder one, right? If if you are a self-employed person that doesn't uh, take a formal salary out of your business, um, you know, you need to think about what are the types of documentation you are going to provide to a bank. You're probably at that point going to want to start by talking to your banker first to understand what documentation they're going to ask for. They might ask for uh, your documentation of how much in payroll taxes you've been paying yourself. Um, they may ask for um, you know your your actual personal tax returns so they can see the income flow through that. Um, but you're going to need to really work with a bank your bank closely there because um, it, it can be a little bit difficult if you have not been uh, you know paying yourself as a, as a as basically a W two employee out of your business. And just touch on timing again, is this payroll from 2019 or the past 12 months? Yeah, so think of it as the average monthly payroll from the from the previous 12 months of the day you apply. So if you apply on April 1st, 
think of it as payroll from you know the last 12 months so essentially uh you know may 1st uh, 2019 all the way through so it's not just your 2019 payroll it's the it's the rolling 12 month average from whatever date you started your application okay um you want to talk a little bit about the interaction between the the, the ppp and the eidl so say a, a company that has an EIDL and then they want to apply for the PPP, how do, how do those work together? Yeah, so uh, one, of the require, one of the things that the PPP can be used for, it, is, it can be used to actually refinance a, a, an EIDL loan. So if you've already applied and gotten one of those $2 million, up to $2 million EIDL loans, um, and you want to take advantage of the better terms of the, pay, of, the pay, of the PPP program, you certainly can do that and you can refinance the loan through that process. And, a refinancing of an EIDL is a is a uh, is a reasonable uh, use of the money and also makes you still eligible to to claim uh, loan forgiveness. Um, you know the 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 imp the important thing to remember is um, if you're not going to refinance your EIDL, you can't double dip. So you can't get two million from you know you can't get an EIDL for a certain amount and then get the full amount of your PPP. It's only going to be um, you know one pot of money you're eligible for and However, it's spill it out between an EIDL loan or a PPP loan. That's the that's the max you're going to get. Okay. Yeah, we're still getting rapid fire questions, Steve. I don't think we can answer them fast enough. So I'm just going to try and you know work our way down and and, and get uh, different questions. If, again, if we don't get to them, please feel free to uh, email me jyoey at alta.org, or you can reach out to our email communications at alta.org, and uh, we will get them answered as quickly as we can. Um, this was an interesting question on on uh, payroll taxes. Is it uh, all payroll taxes, or are you know state and local taxes taxes excluded, Steve? Um, so the way to think about as you're calculating your payroll cost for the PPP is you take your the gross salary of an employee, which is essentially the amount of money you're paying them before you deduct out their FICA side of the payroll tax. Uh, so you're, you're you're taking that number, dividing it by 12. It, it's the easiest way to think about it. Um, now, if you wind up as a business having to, uh, so what you know that that's what you can add in. What you can't add in is your employer portion of paying the payroll tax for uh, uh, you know for the benefit of that employee. Um, but that's only at the, at the federal level, right? So you can't put in your employer portion of the FICA, but you can put in your employer portion of any state and local payroll tax that you put in. So you know, there, there are some complicated things about, you know, about those payroll taxes to think about how much money you're putting in there. But, you know, you, what you really want to do is start with that gross uh, salary that you have, uh, that you've negotiated with your employee, basically divide it by 12 uh, and start with that number. And then you're going to add in things like your health insurance, you're going to think, add in uh, 401k match, things like that. And you're going to deduct out if you have to, if any amount, and what you're not going to add in is any additional taxes that you pay, such as a FICA tax for them. Um, actually got a few questions on um, utilities. Now utilities are included in this, so but does SBA provide any additional color as to what a utility is, utility expense? You know, the, the, the guidelines really just say utility expense. They're, they're really focusing on, you know, water, electric, and things like that. Um, I, I don't believe the it goes as granular to suggest that it might cover things like cable or internet, but you know, certainly those would be utilities for most people. So it's, you know, worth at least talking to your bank about whether or not you can use that. Those are acceptable uses. Um, but th those are the types of utilities we're talking about. Okay. And again, the, the way you look at it is documenting, again, your utility expense um, that you're paying out of it. So again, if you think about putting that money into a separate account and then paying a utility bill right out of it, direct, you know, a, as a direct ACH transfer right out of that account, Going to be the easiest way to document that you spent your money on an allowable on an allowable expense. Okay. Question: When when filling out the app, wanting to know if they can include distributions to shareholders in a sub S core compensation to employees. <laughs> yeah, uh, you yeah. know, so you know, I. I you know, if, if you're looking at that question, I would, I would I would say first off, talk with your bank about you know what what type of documentation that they're they're looking for and what they believe the eligibility rule is here. 
they are really looking, you know, the, the guidelines right now suggest that uh, the answer to that question would probably be no, that it's not, you know, if, if you're just putting distributions, uh, you, you can't put distributions into your shareholders into this loan program unless essentially that is the way you're compensating them as employees of, of the company, right? So if your uh, if your shareholders are all, you know, as an S corp, they're they're also uh, off working in the company as owners and, and and managers of the company, and that's how you're paying them as opposed to paying them a salary. That that's going to be different. Uh, but you know, if these are our shareholders that are non, uh, you know, they're passive shareholders, they're not operational in in the company. You're not going to be able to include uh, any distributions you're putting to them as part of your PPP application. All right. I'm not, I'm only touching the surface of the questions here, Steve. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, forgiveness and uh, how long that, that time frame is? If they end up spending funds after eight weeks from receiving funds, it's still possible for funds to be forgiven? So we expect more guidance on that subject. The way the, the rules are written and the way the law was written originally um, is it says you can only apply for forgiveness of the of the amounts that you spent for the eight week period starting on the date the lo loan was funded that go towards the cost of payroll, costs, uh, utilities, rent, and mortgage interest um, or, or other or other uh, other bar other debt that you have to pay. Um, so it is written that it's really just you have to have spent the money in those eight weeks on those subjects and whatever amount of money you spent you know in that time that covers those subjects is what you can apply for forgiveness my expectation is that that might get uh, changed if they decide to go back and tweak this rule and tweak this law as part of adding more funds into the eligible program so that could change in the future but right now it's just whatever you spent in the eight weeks after the loan is dispersed to you there have been a few, uh, several questions you know, on the uh, some of the orders, you know, deeming companies essential or non-essential. Those that that really isn't part of this eligibility, is this, this that's something else, right? No, it, this is out. You know, again, the only the only qualification is that you are a bit a, a a company that is in business on a, that was in business on April on on February fifteenth, twenty twenty. It doesn't matter whether or not you are considered essential now or non-essential. Um, anybody can apply for this. Um, as well and you know the, again the, the only qualification because I, I see one of these questions here uh, for figuring out your loan amount it's all about the payroll cost time you know so you're only looking at payroll times 2.5 you don't when you're trying to figure out your maximum amount borrowed you don't include in the rent utilities or, or mortgage interest into that amount that, that those are that's not how you determine how much you can borrow that's just some of the things you're allowed to spend the money on and still obtain the forgiveness okay all right. Well, we're about at the top of the hour, and I apologize. We, we probably have uh, near near a hundred questions we still haven't touched. Again, a lot of them kind of are are the, are the same flavor. So hopefully, we, we touched on what you're asking. Um, we'll we'll also send out the, the Q and A document that we have. I may answer some of your questions. The SBA has just issue, issued their you know fax document today that has some additional additional information. You'll be able to get that from our on our website as well, alta.org forward slash coronavirus. Uh, Steve, any other uh, last uh, minute, re last second recommendations? You know, you said the funding, you know, is limited. We encourage, you know, title companies, law firms to, you know, get their application in now and get that process started. Any idea on, on timing and how long it takes? You know, we're hearing anecdotally again, you know, there's $350 billion uh, appropriated for these loans for these loans as I talked about there are some lenders that have already taken applications of about 10 percent of that number already in the first three days we've heard some some companies that have been able to get a loan applied for and funded within three days um, so you can get it fairly quickly um, but that's because you're working with a bank that you already have a relationship with so start through that process have the conversation now even if you don't wind up needing the money um, it's good to at least just get yourself in line because there is only a limited amount of money right now. That could change, but there's only a limited amount right now. Um, and so if you are going to be in a position where you might need that to keep uh, your full-time and part-time employees on the payroll, um, you want to you want to start that process and, and, and get yourself in line for those funds. So, um, you know, I encourage you all to take a, a look at the, at the PPP program, talk to your local bank about an application, 
start the process of an application, you can always back out if you don't if you decide you don't need it later on. But for the most part, these are going to be the cheapest loans you're ever going to get to help you fund your business, um, even if you wind up having to repay back the whole thing. All right. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, just a reminder, if you missed parts of uh, today's webinar, or if you think others uh, in your office would benefit from listening, a uh, recording of the presentation will be emailed to everyone. It will also be, uh, you can also find it on Alta's website. Um, to wrap up again, we need to, to thank Qualia for sponsoring uh, today's presentation. I also wanted to uh, mention a few other webinar opportunities coming up. Next week, we will have a, a webinar on the latest phishing techniques. Uh, scammers are using uh, this opportunity to send phishing emails and, and profit from the, the, this pandemic uh, with more people working remotely. And now is the time to, to learn how to avoid getting scanned by, by this, these fake emails. Uh, if you'd like to register for that email, for, for that webinar, um, you can go to alta.org forward slash webinars. And in May, we'll be offering a, a, another a presentation on, on best practices for re remote workers. Uh, so keep an eye out for uh, information on that webinar as well. And with that, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Um, as a reminder, if you're looking for additional resources, please go to our alta.org coronavirus page. Uh, Steve, uh, thank you again for uh, all the uh, great information on the uh, financial assistance options. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone.